Good morning, everyone, and a very warm welcome to the Swiss Mission. I'm very happy to host you to today's Swiss breakfast. I'm the head of mission, Rita Adam. And today we will address the topic of the uh, important role that soils play in the fight against climate change. Healthy soils are indeed very important. They are closely linked with carbon sequestration and biodiversity. They're also closely linked with agriculture. In other words, the shape they're in has a huge impact on the food that we eat. Uh, and that uh, makes me uh, have a little reference to the breakfast that you will have, and I hope you will enjoy it with the Swiss specialties. But back to the serious topic that we're addressing. The, oh, I must turn this page, sorry. Unfortunately, our soils are threatened by degradation, construction, erosion, compaction, pollution, and biodiversity loss. While both Switzerland and the EU have policies in place to preserve and improve soil quality, we must and will do more. For Switzerland, there are two priorities. Firstly, prevent losses in organic soils, and secondly, increase organic matter in mineral agricultural soils. Primarily, we need agricultural policy instruments that increase and maintain soil organic matter and soil fertility. Carbon removals or certification may play a role, but only with holistic measures will we improve our soils and safeguard our natural livelihoods. The debate about the right mix of policies will become lively as the EU is going to present its proposal on healthy soils soon. Evidence-based research is crucial for sound policy making. I am proud to kickstart this discussion or to contributing to the kickstart of this debate more generally through today's events with two distinguished speakers whom I would like to welcome yet again. We have on the one side Jon Kodescu from the European Commission's DG Envy. We have Professor Tom Crowder from ETH Zurich's Crowder Lab. I hope I pronounced this correctly. <laughs> and we have also our moderator, uh, Goda Naokoyai, Tite, who uh, kindly enough accepted to um, guide us through today's discussions. I, unfortunately, due to um, a very serious uh, Brussels frenzy that you, I trust, all know in the room, will have to leave immediately after my speech. I regret it very much because I, I'm sure I would have learned so much, but I will try to get uh, access to your debates afterwards, also through the registration we make. With this, this is just to apologize because you will see me disappear. It's not for lack of interest. So without further ado, I think I can hand over the microphone to our moderator and I wish you all a very, um, a lot of food for thought, literally, and an interesting debate. Thank you very much. <laughs> Lots of food for thought. Great. Thank you, Ambassador. Good morning, everyone. Very happy to see you all, he see you all here and welcome to our online audience as well. So today, we'll enjoy some Swiss breakfast and discuss why understanding soil ecosystems and biodiversity is important in the mitigation of climate change. We'll take a look at EU policy action to empower soils in the fight against climate change and hear about inspiring research done at ETH Zurich. So as mentioned, my name is Gordon Oyakakita. I'm a news reporter at Science Business, a Brussels-based media organization specializing in RNI policy, and I'll be moderating the discussion between our two lovely speakers. So we have Tom Crowder, who leads Crowder Lab at ETH Zurich, dedicated to studying global ecosystems and using the generated knowledge to protect biodiversity and tackle climate change. And we have Jan Kudescu, Head of Unit for Land Use and Management at the Director General for Environment at the European Commission. So I'll give the floor to our two speakers now for five minutes each to tell us about their work and their perspectives on employing soil policy and scientific know-how to help climate action. And then we'll have a discussion on it all. And about halfway through the session, through the hour, I'll ask everyone for their questions. So please do keep them prepared. And okay, I'll give the floor to Tom now to tell us a little bit about his work. Perfect, thank you so much. And as a classic academic, I can't do anything without slides. <laughs> so I'm gonna uh, show you some pretty pictures along the way. So we know a lot about the physics and chemistry of our planet, but what we don't, haven't historically known so much about is the biology of the planet. And it's that biodiv biodiversity that drives the sort of dynamic nature of the climate system and the biochemical cycles that regulate our climate and everything else. And so we've been really working to try and 
insert that understanding of biodiversity into the climate system. And historically, our understanding of, bio, of, of Earth's nature comes from satellite imagery and things like that, which are fantastic global coverage, but they don't tell us what's going on below the surface. So we take a different kind of approach, which is building on the expertise of people all across the planet, people who are studying their ecosystems and sampling their soils. And by pulling together hundreds of thousands of locations, we can get this global perspective of biodiversity. A lot of our work fo focuses on these beautiful things, fungi, and we understand the vast connectivity of mycelial networks that happen below ecosystems. And by mapping those ecosystems, by mapping those fungal networks across the planet, what some people now call the wood wide web, we're able to see the vast connectivity of these ecosystems and, how, and that can provide useful insights into how we manage and restore those types of ecosystems. We also do a lot of research on natural forests and, 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 and forest ecosystems where we've modeled the scale of Earth's uh, forests, showing that our Earth is home to about three trillion trees. Based on this sort of global perspective, we were able to show that conserving the existing forests is, uh, it can contribute up to 30% of our uh, efforts to reduce carbon emissions. And restoring about a trillion new trees, about 0.9 billion hectares of land, can actually help in the carbon drawdown of about 30% of our existing carbon emissions. So it's a really key component in that fight. But my main, focus in our, my main focus in the lab is actually on the soils, which is what we're here to talk about today, where we do a lot of soil sampling and collecting of massive soil sampling efforts across the planet to generate that global perspective. And this is a figure that I like the most of all, our, all of our figures, showing the distribution of carbon. On, on the top graph, you can see the distribution of carbon in all the world's vegetation in the green, from the South Pole to the North Pole. And then you see the distribution of soil carbon below in the brown. And you can obviously see that soil is by far our biggest terrestrial carbon stock. It's also the biggest pool of biodiversity. And that places it right at the heart of both biodiversity and climate crises. Our research also showed that this enormous pool of carbon that you can see here in the, in the high latitude regions, which includes most of Europe and, and, and beyond, this is where we have the largest stocks of carbon on the planet and the largest pools of at least microbial biodiversity. But these are also, as we know, incredibly vulnerable to things like climate change and land degradation. We've lost over 100 gigatons of carbon. That's 100 trillion tons of carbon from these ecosystems over the last century. Restoring those soils is a critical component in the fight against biodiversity loss and climate change with the potential to capture over 100 trillion tons of carbon. Now, achieving that obviously has many different solutions. We'll talk about some of them today. But the key to it all, from my perspective, is that you cannot get sustainable long-term carbon storage without biological complexity. That can mean cover crops and reduce tilling and all the sort of management, management practices we know. It's about the conservation and restoration of life. But when you have healthy, intact microbial communities interacting with other uh, plants and animals within the system, that is when we get carbon locked away in the long term. So it's biological complexity that is the essence of a sustainable system. This is a, a, an artist's rendition of biological complexity. Don't worry, this is a uh, Frankenstein ecosystem that has never existed in, in real life. But it's sort of exemplifying what, what biological complexity really means. It's, it's everything from the above ground, the below ground, the, the, the birds, plants, microbes, animals, and everything else. And one concern is that we've got to this system, this situation, by essentially valuing individual parts of nature. And when we value the parts that are edible, we lead to massive monocultures of edible, of, you know, farms and agricultural systems, which provide great food security, but come at the expense of some of that biological complexity. One concern is as we move towards nature markets, we're going to make a similar mistake. So we're concerned about climate change. So we, get prop we propagate the carbon part of biodiversity with vast monocultures of spruce trees or eucalyptus trees that we're all familiar with and concerned about. And if that comes at the expense of that biological complexity, it'll have the same damaging effect. What we need to be doing is building markets or building our conservation and restoration strategies out of the valuation of the complexity of the entire system, from the soil to the microbes to the plants to the animals, the variation across genetic species and ecosystem levels. And when we can build in our management strategies to represent this full complexity of life, that's when we get the long-term sustainable impacts that we're all looking for. So that's what our work focuses on. Thank you. Thanks very much. OK, we I'll, heard. I'll stop that now. <laughs> We heard about the science. We shall hear about policy now. Yeah, thanks a lot, and thanks for the uh, the opportunity. Of
course, policy is very much connected to science. So mm. this is probably what uh, you will hear me uh, repeating today, that uh, what we are doing at EU level is and must be based on, uh, on uh, science. Why are we interested in, uh, in soil at, uh, at EU level? Because it's uh, an extremely important uh, support uh, for all sorts of functions. We've heard about uh, carbon um, um, storage, but that's not the only one, but we also heard about balancing the various functions. So the, the uh, healthy soil should provide food and biomass and does provide food and biomass um, uh, also in agriculture, but also in, uh, in forestry, is able to absorb, store and filter water and transform uh, nutrients and uh, substances, also to protect uh, the underground uh, uh, water supplies. Uh, provides the basis, as you've seen, for uh, uh, life and uh, biodiversity for many habitats and, and species. It acts, uh, you've heard about it, as a carbon reservoir, but also pre provides the physical platform for various uh, activities that we all have. And is also a source of uh, raw materials. Um, and it also constitutes an, uh, uh, an archive of geological, geomorphological, and archaeological uh, heritage. So it has very complex indeed functions, and we need to achieve a, a good balance. And what we see, it is a very much concern, I think, for everybody, not only for the EU, but also for us, but for a lot of, uh, of people. And uh, uh, we have various uh, research in the area of soils. So what we see is that 60-70% from uh, uh, let's say various uh, sampling points across the EU, 60-70% of the soils are degraded. And there are, they are facing different forms of, uh, of degradation. We speak about uh, excess nutrients in, uh, in uh, uh, soils, um, uh, also which uh, causes air pollution. We see depletion of, of carbon stocks there. We see peatland uh, degradation, so organic soil degradation. We see soil erosion caused by water or wind. We see because of that desertification, especially in the southern part of, uh, of Europe, we see a lot of soil pollution. We see soil compaction, or we don't see it, but uh, uh, that's also something uh, uh, um, worrying. We see also a lot of soil um, uh, sealing, uh, so this kind of artificialization of, uh, of soil because of various activities uh, uh, that is taking land from uh, uh, you know, nature, but also land for, from, uh, from uh, uh, farms, from agriculture. We see salinization, we see also, and I mentioned, uh, desertification. So we say we need to do something. That was difficult, uh, and I mean, that's also something important to, to, uh, to underline. It's not that the EU wants to intervene on, on this at all costs, but we see that the situation is not good. We see that the, the, the uh, trends are uh, uh, on a negative uh, uh, path uh, in terms of, uh, of soil condition. And we see also a lot of people coming to us. It's very interesting to see, for example, the major food producers who are checking the situation uh, uh, of soils uh, with their farmers, where they are sourcing their, uh, their products. And they even come with, uh, with uh, even more concerning figures, 80% of the, the soils lose their uh, uh, fertility and, and so on. So that's why they're also putting money, they are also helping the, the farmers to put in place measures to increase the, uh, the healthiness of, uh, of soils. So that's why the policy side, uh, we started with strategies. We have what leads us, uh, you know, the European Commission uh, um, and uh, our, uh, well, uh, uh, like uh, openness for, for uh, uh, strategies. We have a second soil strategy, uh, which was adopted in, uh, in uh, November uh, 2021, which assesses a bit the situation of the, the soils and also the need for various action in the member states and, uh, and so on. But we also say that in, to a certain extent, we somehow exhausted the soft means of, of intervention. So we see some need of intervention also at, uh, at EU level. First of all, because we don't know the situation of soils. I mean, what I told you, 60-70% is based on various samplings around uh, the EU, but we don't have uh, 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 thorough knowledge about the situation of soils. I mean, we don't know what happens, uh, you know, uh, 10 meters or 100 meters away from our home here in Brussels or in, uh, in, uh, in any member state. 
So we lack a very thorough knowledge of the situation of soils. Uh, we also lack uh, knowledge about, uh, you know, the, the precise cause of, uh, of degradation, of soil degradation. And there are measures which have been put in place and are functioning, but uh, uh, not, uh, not everywhere. And um, uh, sometimes they have their own, uh, they, their own costs. So this uh, uh, needs also to be taken into account. And with policy measures, we hope that this can be addressed as well. So I'll stop here and then... Uh, okay, I'll... thank you. So you painted quite a negative <coughs> picture here in terms of soil health. So let's perhaps focus today's discussion on solutions and how we can make it better. So Tom, I turn to you first. Uh, you've explained to us what role clim uh, soils play in climate change and carbon storage. And so could you tell us what measures work best in improving soil carbon storage and thus helping us fight climate change? What would be kind of the number one thing to do to save our soils and thus protect biodiversity and fight climate change? Uh, yes, for the number one thing, it's always a hard thing, but at, that, yeah. at the highest level, the answer would be, again, for, for me, improve the biological complexity of the system. That mm -hmm. is when, it's, that when soil is at its healthiest. And that obviously means doing our utmost to conserve nature where we have it. Mm -hmm. It also means where possible, you know, in, in this, these 30% goals, are, are based on real, like, resilient science to try to restore, you know, r recover natural biodiversity within 30% of degraded lands. Uh, but, of course, one of the biggest opportunities exists within our managed landscapes where mm -hmm. the, you know, uh, regenerative practices and, um, you know, reduced tilling practices and cover crops and, and various different mechanisms can be used to promote the health of biological complexity within the soil. And when that happens, that's when we get carbon locked up for in the long term. There's been a, a paradigm, sh paradigm shift recently in our understanding of how carbon gets trapped in soil. Mm -hmm. We thought it was just leaves falling onto the surface and then some of that carbon stays and some of it gets decomposed. But what we're realizing is it's the process of incorporating that carbon into microbial biomass, which then dies and then gets incorporated into the next level of microbial biomass. Mm -hmm. and, then and it's over iterations and iterations of microbes feeding on other microbes feeding on other microbes that we get really long-term carbon sequestration so any mechanism that we can implement that promotes that microbial life will improve the long-term sustainability of carbon sequestration okay so it's a very holistic approach then there's not one answer it's just making the biodiversity better okay and so that's the science and how does the european commission translate that into policy how do you work with scientists how do you how do you make all of this happen at eu level well, um, as I said, we have this, uh, this strategy which lists a uh, different type of, uh, of action, some of it mm -hmm. uh, which is already there, some which uh, needs to be taken. One important uh, area is, is uh, policy intervention. So we are working on a, on a uh, directive um, on uh, uh, what we call it uh, soil health uh, law. It's about soil protection. And I think one way of blending this in mm -hmm. uh, and one difficulty at the same time is to define what is a healthy soil and of course there we have the difficulty of the diversity of soils and the local mm -hmm. geographical climatic conditions which makes uh, you know that a healthy soil in one part may differ in terms of definition from uh, you know in another part but how to blend science and then policy uh, that's extremely uh, that's extremely important. We look at the, the types of degradations of, uh, of uh, soil. I think I mentioned already uh, some of them. It was just to give you a, uh, an idea, uh, soil contamination or soil pollution is an extremely uh, important one. So we need to define which are the pollutants, uh, uh, the key pollutants uh, affecting the uh, the soil, and then work on that. Uh, take measures to address these various causes of, uh, of uh, 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 for example, contamination or soil erosion. So, and there are measures which have been tested into, into practice. As I said, the costs may differ. Uh, some who are already applying them, so this kind of, uh, for example, soil uh, erosion mm -hmm. is caused, for example, in, uh, in agricultural lands by leaving the soil bare. 
So one kind of key principle is try to cover them as much as possible also during the, the, the winter uh, season. There are also uh, solutions, so depending on the type of crops you put uh, on during this winter period, this could also improve, for example, the, the, some of the vegetables have the capacity also to improve the content of carbon. So that's also very important. So just to reply to you very shortly uh, or to sum up, uh, we should look at deterioration per deterioration, the type of degradation, and put measures in place to address uh, uh, this. What, something important is it's not only policy. I think we need to take the land managers and, uh, and land uh, owners, farmers, mm -hmm. uh, foresters, and so on, on board. Mm -hmm. And we can do this uh, two ways. Uh, make them aware that in the longer run, uh, if something is not uh, being done, soil fertility, biodiversity, and carbon, and so on, uh, uh, is lost and uh, we'll have, uh, we'll face more and more problems, so there, this will be a direct impact on them. A second, try to help them because some of those measures, as I said, they are not easy, so they need, uh, they need our support. Okay, so that's convincing landowners and managers to, to take action, but what about convincing governments to take action? Is there enough willingness at government level to invest in these nature-based solutions? and in soil health, because um, obviously, yeah, as you said, it costs money, but it's also a long-term game. Well, you know, we have, uh, it's not the first time when we are coming up with a proposal for a directive. Uh, it happened also 15 years ago and it didn't fly. Uh, so the commission proposed, but it was not adopted. And one reason was that this was perceived to be uh, you know, policy, uh, which should be dealt with at national level. But it was also kind of, uh, um, uh, I would say, lack of awareness of the, the seriousness of the, the, the problem. So this has changed a lot. So we are having a lot, or we have been uh, having a lot of discussions with all kinds of stakeholders, and in particular our uh, uh, national authorities and member states. So all start to realize, also with the development of, uh, of knowledge, that mm -hmm. we have something which is a limited resource, and you know uh, it takes probably a human uh, uh, life uh, span uh, in order to restore uh, uh, soil. So it's a resource which is not uh, easily uh, you know, rejuvenated. Mm -hmm. We cannot fix it. So this is a lot of, um, yeah, it's a lot of thought going on. So I think things are starting to move and mm -hmm. we realize that we need to take uh, action. Of course, from there to taking uh, the action, especially when it has implications and it has costs, it's a difference. That's why we feel that we need to do something to make a request, uh, uh, you know, and provide some obligations at, uh, at, at EU level. So we make sure that action is taken everywhere and that this issue is put on the, you know, it's right place on the, on the political agenda in each country. Mm -hmm. And there is also, maybe I should add, there was also a perception that, you know, soil does not move. Uh, and it's a, a national problem. So it's not like water, it's not like air, it's not circulating a lot, but that's not true. I mean, even if we take, I mentioned already the, the uh, 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 this erosion, which mm -hmm. is caused by winds, which is caused also by, uh, by water. Uh, well, I don't think, uh, we have figures, but I don't bore you with, uh, with this, but our rivers carry a lot of, uh, a lot of soil. Well, some of this is natural, uh, but some can be also prevented because this causes uh, erosion and it has a cross-border effect on, uh, on that. The same about uh, you know, soil pollution. We have a lot of contaminated sites in the EU and that's a part of what we want to, to address. We estimate it's more than two, probably between two and three million polluted sites in the uh, former industrial uh, uh, sites in, uh, in, uh, in Europe and only a tiny fraction of them have been uh, uh, investigated properly and decontaminated. So that's also something which may have an impact, you know, cross-border impact. Yeah, but I guess it's also a bigger question of how we address climate restoration. And you had some ideas about this when we talked in preparation for the session about redefining what restoration means. Could you expand a little bit on that? Right, yeah, so it, it feels like if in, 
if you were to mention the word, word restoration to the general public, mm. there seems to be a bit of a split between some people think it's about planting loads of trees to get loads of carbon, whereas others think it's about rejuvenating biodiversity for the for local well-being. And, and somehow we need to very, very powerful, strongly redefine it to ensure that it is the latter and not the former. Because if everything is based on our climate goals, when if, if our, our efforts to restore nature are based purely on climate or even very strongly on climate, we are going... It, it just incentivizes the the potential management of ecosystems that can overlook things like biodiversity and human well-being. And when you get those things wrong, not only do, does that lead to the degradation of the ecosystems in the long run anyway, but it causes can cause devastating impacts along the way. When we if if we take any decisions that come at the expense of human well-being and biodiversity, the the, the harm can outweigh the good. So we need to be focusing instead. When we, when we talk about restoration or conservation, about the, the goals being biodiversity for local well-being of people. When we nail those two things, that is when you get massive long-term carbon storage, mm. and that is when the benefits to climate happen, but only as a byproduct, not as the primary goal. So it's just sort of refocusing the, the goal for some people towards the well-being of people and the biodiversity they depend on, um, mm. rather than climate change first. Yeah, so it's about local action, essentially. Right. Yeah, Jan, what, do you have anything to say about that? Yeah, I think it's a lot. Uh, it's um, it's local action, and it's indeed addressing the various uh, issues. So you may have uh, uh, nature uh, mm. land; you need to to uh, uh, preserve it uh, and get the best uh, out of it. Um, for example, I think you mentioned uh, uh, forests and forestry. So, what type of trees you have on a let's say, uh, stand on a plot of land, that's very important. So if you have a monoculture, uh, that's much less in terms of uh, biodiversity mm -hmm. than, uh, than a kind of a mixed forest. If you intervene and have, uh, 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 you know, high-scale uh, um, uh, clear cuts, then, of course, this has a big impact on the, the, uh, the carbon. So it's, it's, it depends a lot on how you manage this. You may have also uh, uh, farmland, so that's also important uh, uh, how you manage it. And there are a lot of measures also including in the, in the existing policies such as uh, uh, common agricultural policy, which could be applied and are applied, unfortunately not on a very large uh, scale, to improve the condition of the soil what's above mm -hmm. and also what's, uh, what's uh, uh, beneath. <laughs> so awareness is very important. Be aware of what's around and what you can do, or what we can do as uh, you know, landowners, as, uh, even as uh, citizens. And of course, we are not looking only uh, in, uh, in our intervention and then the policy part, we are looking at all types of soils. So I mentioned uh, you know, natural soils, I mentioned uh, agriculture, forestry but also urban land. So that's also important how we, uh, we preserve our uh, soil, which is, mm -hmm. uh, well, fortunately, not, uh, still not sealed in, uh, in, our, uh, in our towns. And we know how much it, uh, it uh, provides, uh, you know, shelter, biodiversity. And we all enjoy a walk in the, in the park, uh, uh, you know, between two, two, uh, two buildings. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we know it's important and necessary. But how do we then guide investment there? Because one common misconception is that investing money in these kinds of projects and biodiversity and nature-based solutions is kind of risky. It's a complicated field. You never know what happens. There's, well, when it comes to soils, there's not a lot of data that we have, right? And monitoring is expensive. And so how is it really this uncertain putting money in these sorts of solutions? And what's the best way to actually direct resources and convince people that it's a good idea? I don't know, it's a question for both of you. Mm -hmm. Who would like to start? Tom, for your smiling and nodding. Sure, <laughs> yeah, so again, I, I guess we might uh, tackle this question from the managed landscapes and uh, from a natural landscape slightly mm -hmm. differently, but but w when I'm talking about the sort of the natural landscapes and, and even the recovery of biodiversity in managed landscapes, the, I do see Private sector funding seems to recognize increasingly the, the, the importance of nature, and therefore we, we are seeing really exciting avenues, you know, like mm. the Green New Deal and all these things, uh, to incentivize uh, biodiversity action. But from the private, private sector, it seems like there's this massive intrepidation, massive fear of, of, of investing in nature. And that is because of, you know, fears that 
maybe you get no return on your thing, or maybe you do more harm than good, or, more, or maybe there's, you know, there's, there's uncertainty in the measurements of the impacts. And these are all very, very true. Um, but again, that comes back to my last point. If, if your focus is purely on carbon, then your chances of doing more harm than good are, 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 are a lot higher than if your focus is on biodiversity and mm. people. And instead, and, and what's tended to happen as a result is everybody is, you know, there's, there's a lot of, of um, intense pressure on organizations to invest well into nature. And as a result, everyone's too scared to, to sort of, um, everyone's very nervous. And as a result, they're focusing only on the few very well successful, well-funded successful mm. projects. And 10 or 100 well-funded long-term you know, very scientifically rigorous restoration projects around the world is not a global restoration movement. What we need to do is move away from the focus of carbon, away from the focus on a very small number of projects towards distributing funding across hundreds of thousands of local communities who can then become, you know, have enough financial security to find the economically sustainable options, which is when we always see nature recovering. And so what I'd like us to do is move away from this, this sort of, safe uh, investing in, in, in one big car carbon offsetting project towards distributing wealth across hundreds of thousands of local communities that can be economically empowered by the biodiversity they depend on. And that's when, obviously, we're gonna, there's going to be risk, there's going to be failures, there's going to be challenges, but it's the redistribution of wealth across the planet that is at the foundation of a global restoration movement. It's not yeah. successfully offsetting your carbon emissions in one location. Yeah, I mean, I guess it's also redistribution of risk in a way. Right. If you have a lot of projects, Jan, how do you see this? So lots of small projects versus big ones. Well, I think it's a place for uh, for big ones, for small ones, but they depend again a lot on uh, on awareness, and the awareness depends on uh, on the knowledge. So we've looked uh, with what we are doing at uh, at policy level. We have, uh, as you know, we are. Uh, requested to look into the cost uh, and benefits of a possible intervention. And what we found from the data uh, we have, again, it's a selection of data, but it's, it's still representative. The cost of inaction is around 50 billion uh, a year. And these are kind of, uh, um, you know, uh, clear costs which can be, uh, can be uh, uh, calculated and have been, uh, have been estimated not dealing with various uh, uh, degradations. Of course, these costs are different for various categories of, uh, of people, but it becomes more and more clear that without, uh, without uh, uh, an intervention, without taking measures to address uh, soil degradation, we are not losing only money, we are mm -hmm. losing much more than, uh, than, uh, than that. Of course, if you do different type of uh, different types of, uh, of uh, interventions. Uh, this would impact, so the costs would be uh, borne uh, in, a, in a different manner by various categories. Of course, uh, you know, if you are a farm uh, uh, owner, uh, farm manager, uh, and you are requested to uh, address the, the, the degradation of your soil, you would bear the cost in the first place. And this needs to be taken into account. So we need various funds. I think private funds are important. Public funds are important. But also time is important. Mm. We need also, even if, if so, if we do a, an intervention, this needs to take into account properly these costs and the kind of the, uh, give sufficient time to adjust, for example, agricultural practices uh, and so on. Um, um, in a realistic, uh, realistic way, it's not uh, um, it's not easy, mm. but we have seen that it is working, and in the long term, it produces a lot of uh, of uh, benefits. Sometimes even in the in the short uh, in the short run. Okay, but so to take a bird's eye view, we there's a lot going on. There is an EU soil law coming this summer that you're going to propose. <coughs> But so what's going to be the impact on a global level? Because obviously climate change, that's, that's going to affect the entire world. But so the EU is taking action, Switzerland is taking action. How much impact can this policy have to actually 
tackle climate change. Um, yeah. <laughs> from from the academic perspective, it's in, it's huge. Not only from mm -hmm. you know, as I mentioned, as I showed on my graph, the EU, Europe is in some of the most carbon rich mm. ecosystems on the planet. This is we're talking trillions of tons of carbon in the long term. Carbon is uh, sorry, soil is the largest carbon stock because once carbon enters the soil, if it's not disturbed too readily, it can stay for a very, 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 very long time. And that slow carbon turnover mean leads to long term buildup of huge carbon stocks and it will have a direct, tangible mm. and positive impact uh, at a global scale. Um, but I think just as importantly is the sort of, um, uh, I don't know what the word is, but the, the, the sort of, I don't want to say setting an example, but it's a, it's a leadership move. You know, if, if, if the EU can successfully build in a soil law that, mm -hmm. bring, that, that does help farmers and land managers and, and conservationists to rejuvenate, to be incentivized to rejuvenate soil carbon and soil health, that surely will be, a, a, hopefully, I, I believe there'll be knock-on effects for uh, you mm -hmm. know, positive socio-economic effects that happen, and hopefully that will be an example to everywhere else to, to try and promote similar kind of practices. I do think that mm -hmm. the soil and the health of soil is at the core of every environmental movement, and it could be a really good shining example to the world. Okay, so it's not a dire situation, and we do have it in our hands. And actually, this might be a good time to bring in an audience question about the soil health law as well for Mr. Codescu. Uh, when will the soil health law come into force, and can you give examples of measures that will be implemented under the soil health law? So we envisage to, to have this uh, adopted or proposed by the, by the Commission uh, before the summer. Uh, June, uh, June, July, uh, the idea is to have um, a directive providing uh, sufficient flexibility to the, uh, to the national authorities, to the member states, for the reasons I just mentioned. Uh, we realize it's not an easy intervention and some adjustments require, uh, require time. It would have what uh, we call uh, uh, some, uh, some building blocks. First is to define, to have a common definition of what is healthy soil. So for that, we would uh, pick up a few um, uh, key descriptors uh, of, uh, of soil. So for example, soil erosion, um, um, uh, carbon content, uh, um, uh, soil pollution compaction, and, uh, and so on and identify a few values um, at, uh, at EU level beyond which or below which the soils would lose uh, their, uh, their capacity to provide ecosystem services. That's not an easy fit. That's the, mm -hmm. that, and there is a clear link with the, with the science because for some of this, it is possible to identify this kind of ranges if you want uh, to cover all soils uh, that are in the, in the European Union, for some of them that's not possible. So for some it would be a requirement to the member states to identify this, uh, this uh, for example, the water content in, in, in soils to do it at, uh, at national level. And for some of them, we know that, uh, for example, nitrogen in, uh, in soil, uh, which comes from fertilizers, but not only for air deposition and, uh, and so on, has a big impact on the, on the soil uh, health, but it is not possible with the science we have today to estimate you know, what's the level, the critical level at which a soil loses its uh, various types of soil, rather, lose their, uh, their capacity to provide ecosystem services. So there, we would want to have only monitoring. Um, so, you know, providing the definition, providing this kind of indicators, then setting in place a monitoring network so that we have the knowledge reasonable knowledge uh, in each member state on the situation of soil and then having some requirements on the sustainable soil management uh, uh, to preserve you know soils which are healthy we still have mm -hmm. healthy soils but they need to be preserved uh, uh, and not uh, deteriorated uh, and also um, have some uh, uh, requirements on uh, and I think the key objective and this comes from the strategy that I, uh, I mentioned is have healthy soils by 2050. Mm -hmm. So we are working against uh, we are proposing to work against uh, uh, certain uh, um, uh, time schedule uh, which gives a bit of flexibility so we still uh, have uh, more than uh, than uh, 25 years uh, there but this, this also 
helps you know focused minds and uh, and, and action so for that we would have some uh, some requirements for uh, for uh, soil restoration so the, the soils which are found to be in an unhealthy condition they need to be restored and we discussed about various measures which could be put in place this would be left to the member states will have probably some guiding principles uh, so there should be some some programs of, uh, of measures and then we have the separated issue that I uh, I pointed out this uh, many sites which are polluted so identified or not identified sites but which can be uh, you know it's not about diffuse pollution but uh, you know previous uh, industrial military or whatever sites which cause a lot of, uh, of problems so we would also deal with that and but uh, come up with the risk-based approach so leave the assessment of the you know the risk on uh, big risk on uh, on the environment and uh, and health to the member states but have a requirement um, to identify those and uh, wh where the risk is uh, found to be unacceptable that measures are taken to, to treat this. This causes a lot of, uh, I mean, th this requires a lot of, uh, of investment, of, of costs, so we are also mindful of, uh, of that. So that yeah. would be the, if you want, the main uh, lines of intervention in, in what yeah. we are uh, uh, you know, <coughs> working on. And are EU member states ready to commit this time? Well, we'll see. But as I said, from the discussions we have, it's much more openness uh, on that. Of course, they would want to see what will be put on the table, uh, you know, what would be the impact on them, what would be the requirements, and also uh, maybe it's something important to say. Soil could benefit from existing uh, legislation or frameworks uh, already, but we think this is, I mean, I mentioned the, the common agricultural policy, we have the nature restoration law, and, um, with, uh, and so on, a Habitats Directive for the Biodiversity and, uh, and uh, Waste Management uh, uh, Directives. So there is a lot of a key which help mm -hmm. a bit, but we think uh, and we have data to prove that it's not sufficient. But of course, everybody, and in particular the member states, are interested about coherence and not to be, uh, you know, uh, have to face uh, uh, unnecessary burden. So we have been looking into that. So we'll try to convince them also uh, along these lines. Okay. I see there are questions coming in online, so maybe it's a good time to engage our audience. But I'm thinking I'll give the floor first to our audience here in person. Does anyone have a question that they would like to ask at this point? Yeah, we have two, we have three. Bernadette? Yeah, perhaps, yeah. Lady in green. Here you go. Thank you. Good, good morning. Um, my name is Claire Dupont. I'm professor at Ghent University. Um, I wanted to come to your, quest, to your point, Jan, about the coherence between the measures. Because when you were discussing earlier, you were mentioning particularly the responsibility at local level with communities and landowners, which of course the EU itself does not really have much engagement with. And we've also seen quite significant difficulties in a, um, cap reform and also facing difficulties with the nature restoration law. So I'm just wondering how you think you can overcome some of these challenges with the soil health law, or have you got a plan there? Shall I reply? Yep. Um, <laughs> thanks for the question. Yeah, it's an important uh, one. Well, one of the answers it relates to awareness uh, raising um, and the, the importance of knowledge. And we see already, and we are discussing already with farmers, with farmers associations, and uh, they see the need of, uh, of doing something. And also we think that if there is a legal framework there with clear requirements, that would also spur investment in this, uh, in this uh, uh, area. Uh, then there might be some measures. I think this, uh, you know, the fact that uh, they are uh, improving or preserving the health of, uh, of soil also provides a service to the you know, larger uh, public, to the society. And recognition is also important, but sometimes also getting some advantage of that. So we are thinking about some links, you know, with the certification and uh, uh, the function of the, the, the soil as a carbon uh, sink, but not only. So 
the fact we, we need to make some connections and to ease this uh, kind of, um, uh, you know, the, the possibility to, to get some benefits out of the fact that you are preserving your, uh, your land and also, you know, convince people that uh, investing in that brings, uh, uh, brings benefits. <coughs> A second line of action would be in this respect would be leaving as much, uh, as much flexibility to, to the national authority as possible. Sometimes, the, you know, improving uh, soil health can be done not with requirements, but with voluntary action. Um, and also with, uh, you know, helping them out uh, uh, and so on. Uh, so, uh, yeah, we'll try to engage as, uh, as much as possible and uh, regulate only as far as it is necessary to kind of put things in motion, if you want. So, yeah, that would be my, uh, my uh, uh, response. And also maybe to showcase the good examples, because there are a lot uh, and we see around and we see it's, uh, it's uh, working. Thank you, Jan. Okay, and let's take a question from the online audience now for Tom. Um, it's about data. Uh, the need to develop our knowledge about soils has been mentioned several times. What does science need from governments to improve the databases about soil degradation types and relevant measures? What can, what can the governments do for you? Yeah, so I think one thing is, um, you know, the mention of databases, it's these, the, having globally standardized databases is gold. Until we have that, it's very hard to do these global consensus analyses to really understand which regions are most degraded and which regions are high priority. And so uh, traditionally, research funding doesn't promote just the building of databases. It's normally about finding a new innovation or finding a new mm -hmm. discovery. And if, it can, if there can be more research funding focused towards you know, building sustain, uh, sort of standardized databases, that is going to benefit thousands of innovations, not just the one that you fund. So that's one angle. The other is, and it's really obvious, and I'm sure every scientist will always say it, but it's long-term funding is, or, or long-term funding allows the flexibility and freedom to think outside the box. What tends to happen, uh, particularly with EU grants actually is, you have very, very strict reporting and very specific details on exactly what you're gonna do and when you're gonna do it, which, unfortunately isn't a scientific process. So it often leads people to be, to be trapped down research lines that end up not being the most, you know, as, as you go down the research process, you realize, oh, that thing I proposed two years ago that was accepted for a grant is okay, but it's not representing the full holistic nature of what's going on and I'm missing all of these processes. Having funding that is flexible enough to, to allow people to explore beyond the proposed research topic is yeah. so important. Every single exciting research discovery we've had has come, as a, has come beyond or outside of something that I proposed or something that we proposed in an EU grant or in a, in a, in a grant proposal. So flexibility Absolutely. is the core of creativity in science and so we need funding. Yeah. That Are we talking about the kind of grants that the European Research Council provides absolutely so you know it's really exciting to see these big collaborative grants being mm -hmm. be, uh, becoming available uh, facilitating right. collaborations across organizations that brings together you know different perspectives and multidisciplinarity that is a really exciting avenue but I feel like all research grants that are ever mm -hmm. allowed should be built in 30 50 percent of it should be not targeted to exactly what was proposed on the date mm -hmm. uh, of, of proposal because it's always the discoveries you find along the way that lead to the best dis the best interventions, not the the ones you proposed four years ago. Okay, and Jan, you're not an expert in research policy, I imagine, but is this something that's been discussed in the Commission, at in your directorate, how to best support researchers? Because obviously they're an important part of the puzzle in this endeavor. Yeah, it's not only my uh, my uh, directorate. So I mean, uh, Director General Environment, but we are working also with uh, with Director General uh, uh, Agri uh, Agriculture, also with uh, with RTD. Mm -hmm. We have already in place, uh, irrespective of the, the upcoming uh, legal framework, we have uh, research uh, also done with. Uh, yeah, and I didn't mention JRC or Joint Research Centers. Uh, so we have what we call the, the soil mission um, mm -hmm. uh, and also soil observatory. So looking into this and. Uh, you know how to monitor, how to get the knowledge better, but also looking into the uh, the measures which could uh, improve. So indeed, 
uh, money is already and the attention is put into, into this and it's extremely important and that's I think one of the uh, I mean, the fact that we would uh, hopefully have uh, some clear legal framework uh, for this, uh, you know, for this part uh, which has not, not been addressed uh, so far is not the end of the game. In fact, it is the beginning. We need to do much more than uh, yeah. regulate. Uh, we need support and for that we need knowledge we, and we need uh, also, uh, you know, um, kind of streamlining the, the, mm -hmm. the funding for, uh, for that. What we also plan to do together with this um, uh, uh, this piece of legislation when proposing it is to have uh, what we call a staff working document, the, the possibilities, mapping out a bit the possibilities of funding uh, okay. for SOI, which would be a useful instrument also to start with. It would not be the end of the, the road. Okay, great to hear. We had more questions in the room. Gentleman in the middle had a question? Yeah. Thank you so much, and great to be uh, great to be talking about uh, soil. It's not often that you get a chance to make soil sexy, so thank you uh, uh, for for enabling that. Um, my question was really about um, Tom. You talked about the the connections between um, the climate debate and the biodiversity debate, and uh, I mean, I'm coming from the UK mission to the EU, and for us, the linked crises of climate and nature are our top policy priority internationally. We think it's our top thematic priority. It should underpin everything we do. Um, I think what you did was shine a bit of a spotlight on, we think there's a lot of synergy between those two agendas and trying to find synergistic solutions. But you also pointed to the risk. Um, and if you stampede towards an approach that's just about carbon, are you gonna undermine the maybe longer term, much more beneficial approaches of a more complex e ecosystem. But policymakers need pace and, and the climate crisis requires pace um, because if we fail to tackle climate change, everything will become worse because it's such a stress multiplier. So I wondered if you could try and help us to identify what are some of the solutions that help us to build that longer term biological complexity but that might deliver some of those shorter, quicker wins on the pathway towards complexity while avoiding you know, lock into very simplistic ecosystems just based around carbon. Is there a way to really maximize the synergy on the response to nature and climate? It's a good question. There's quite a lot in there that, that, that I want to touch on. You're right, the synergy is, it's, it, is, it underpins everything. We are fighting the combined threats of biodiversity loss and climate change in one, and also pandemics and food insecurity and everything else. It's, it's the, cross the overlap between all of these things that makes nature such, you know, whether it's managed or, or uh, natural landscapes, that's what makes nature this incredibly um, in important opportunity to address all global threats. Um, and yeah, I was warning against the risk of we focus on carbon, we'll forget the other benefits, and that means more long-term damaging effects. You know, we always talk about eucalyptus plantations or spruce plantations, whatever it is, but the, anything, if you, if carbon's the focus, we'll maximize for carbon. If frogs are the focus, we'll maximize for frogs, and that also won't benefit everyone else. We need the complexity of the system. And this is where I think that, that some misconceptions come in, because you mentioned then speed, and you, you know, the, I think there is this, this misconception that if we maximize for carbon, we will get, you know, we, we will get fast growing trees will capture carbon rapidly and that'll be a rapid approach for, for sequestration. This is a, usually a pretty useless approach for sequestration. It's not like, oh, there's this trade off between speed and effectiveness, uh, sort of um, speed and impact. If you do that, we won't get long-term sequestration. Cap capturing carbon for five, ten years but before they all get taken down by a bark beetle, isn't, that's not a climate impact. It's only ever a climate impact when the biodiversity is, is working and when the people want it to be there. And that doesn't mean it needs to be much slower. It, you know, and obviously, we're talking about EU policy here, so it's a bit out of topic, but in the tropics, you put a fence up and allow nature to recover, you'll get a pretty healthy forest within five to 10 years that is flourishing. And you know, you obviously, the longer you keep that, the longer, the, the, the better the carbon storage gets. But ecosystems will regenerate in a large proportion of the world very naturally on their own. And I've got to highlight that natural regeneration is a really key part of this. But sustainable agricultural practices can have carbon impacts 
really rapidly. Again, you mentioned cover crops. Simply having a cover crop and minimizing tilling can have incredible impacts within one year. It's hard to measure those impacts in the soil. That's the, the, the challenge is that soil is so heterogeneous that if I take five samples this year and then and I take the same five samples next year, even if the amount of carbon in the soil has doubled, the variability between my five samples will mean I'll statistically struggle to see it, but it doesn't mean that the carbon isn't accumulating. It's just hard to measure it in short time periods. So I, I, what I, I guess what I'm saying is don't let the measurement uncertainty obscure the fact that there is accumulation happening. When you have healthy ecosystems and healthy biodiversity, the carbon accumulation can be very rapid. Uh, our ability to monitor it gets easier and easier over time. And after 10 years, it's easier to monitor than after one year. Um, but every single approach that promotes biodiversity, I believe, is, a, is a, a relatively rapid approach for capturing carbon. And we talk about comparing it with things like direct air carbon capture. That sounds like a wonderful climate solution. But right now, there's firstly, it's not cost of we haven't got the technology to a cost-effective state yet. I, I'm very supportive of direct air carbon capture, by the way, but it's not yet cost of, as cost-effective, and it certainly can't be done at the scale that nature can be done right now. So it is our fastest and most optimistic solution, and it, it just we can't be compromising by focusing only on carbon and not biodiversity. Um, I feel like I want to talk about that bit forever, so I feel like I didn't give you a very <laughs> succinct thing. But no, but so it's about yeah. accepting complexity and uncertainty at yeah, the end right, of the day. Right, right. Okay, and I think we have one more question there in yellow. Uh, sorry, sorry, sorry. With the Evers from the Mission of Norway to the EU, and we hosted an event recently on nature based solutions. Uh, and um, adding to the former question, just a comment. Uh, since it's linked to soil health uh, uh, restoration and, and nature-based solutions, we also invited, uh, we have indigenous peoples in Norway, the Sami, uh, and also a youth representative, and they were, at the global level, very concerned with the, uh, that uh, nature-based solutions should not be used for carbon offset, offsets or for greenwashing. So their message was that we need some safeguards, environmental safeguards, to. Um, uh, to make sure that those are solutions that are good uh, for the benefit of nature and also for welfare. And, and with that comes the climate effects, like you already pointed out. Just a comment that we have, have this uh, side also with indigenous peoples and uh, the local communities who want to be involved. Thank you. Yeah, again, I think that points to... <coughs> Carbon is the wonderful byproduct of healthy nature. It can't be the other way around. If you aim for carbon, you'll, oh, sometimes you'll get healthy nature, but often you'll get terrible nature, which, which is devastating. If, if carbon is the byproduct and pandemic prevention is the byproduct and food, in, food security is the byproduct, then is when you'll get long term, you know, you'll get those things in the long term. One other sort of mention, thing that I didn't mention about, you know, ability, you, you know, the speed thing is there's. So, uh, you know, subtle interventions can be so massive. We've got really big, strong evidence at the moment about the role of microbiome introductions. And this actually comes a lot from in indigenous knowledge about how people have been managing soils in, 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 um, in the Amazon rainforest, about how soil management can promote ecosystem restoration. And globally, we see when people simply spread a little bit of a healthy soil microbiome onto your agricultural soil, your increase yields by up to 60%, and you can increase regeneration rates by 200%. That's not by planting a faster growing tree or adding any carbon to the system. It's simply allowing the recovery of a healthy microbiome so that the forest can, re so that your vegetation can recover. There's really useful ways of working with biodiversity that can promote the speed of recovery. Okay, so small actions can have a big impact. Great. So we're kind of running out of time, but I wanted to ask you to both well, one last question. We are, after all, at the Swiss mission here. Um, so I wanted to ask about cooperation with Switzerland. Um, Jan, perhaps you could start. Um, how can the EU and Switzerland work best together? Is there a joint action at this moment? And do you see joint action in the future when it comes to soil health? Well, for the moment, we are focusing on uh, what's inside the, uh, the European Union. I mm -hmm. do a bit of, uh, of uh, house uh, cleaning. But as I mentioned already, soil is not a local issue. It is a local issue, but, but there are cross-border um, uh, impacts. Uh, carbon is one, uh, <coughs> one thing. 
uh, you know, erosion and pollution is, is another thing. And also, well, apart from this, um, exchanging good practice, it's, it's also a, a way to go. So yeah, uh, we are also looking forward uh, to see we, how we can uh, further cooperate. I think on soil as such, there is not much, uh, at least as far as I know. Uh, on other areas, uh, you know, waste related and, and so on, there has been more, uh, more cooperation. But we are looking forward. Uh, and of course, if we develop uh, this area in, this, uh, in the uh, European Union, there will be also more scope of, of uh, uh, having this international cooperation as well. Okay, so in the future. Yep. And Tom, when it comes to research, what would best enable you to work with researchers in Europe? Oh, yeah, obviously, it again goes without saying, EU funding being able to support Swiss research is obviously very, very valuable. But, it, you know, right now, it's, there's still the capacity for Swiss researchers to collaborate with EU researchers mm -hmm. if, if they're the ones leading a research proposal. But obviously, we want, as everyone does, more removing the barriers and increasing the, the amount of collaboration will also mean increasing the, you know, allowing the opportunity for funding to be to be spread in, in both directions. You know, there's good mm. good research funding in, in, in Switzerland, which could benefit other, uh, you know, European researchers that uh, uh, the research effect would then benefit Switzerland in return. Uh, and so I think there's clearly two-way co cooperation that, that would be really valuable. Uh, I, I think, you know, what I do like is that the, even, even with, Swi you know, the Swiss sort of funding situation, there is this really promoted uh, idea of cooperation within mm. the EU. And I do think it has probably increased the, the number of sort of interdisciplinary collaborative grants. Um, but more of that can only be better. Yeah, of course. Well, it's great to hear there is willingness. That's the most important thing. OK, and I guess that's a wrap up. Yeah, we've, we've had our hour. Uh, hope you've enjoyed it. Uh, thank you so much for our speakers. It was really interesting. And um, yeah, hope everyone enjoyed the breakfast. And um, that's a wrap. <laughs> Thanks a lot.